Hey programmers, welcome back. I think this video is pretty important because load balancers are a crucial part of every software system, okay, of every IT system. They're used for every application, for every server. So it doesn't matter what kind of a developer you are, whether you're a backend developer, a phone developer, or a full stack developer, I don't care. I'm pretty sure that you are using load balancers in the system that you're working on. So this video is primarily intended for developers, people who want to level up their knowledge and become like software architects, or for those who simply are preparing for design system interviews and want to know how load balancers work in depth, all right? And I'm also going to create a design system playlist or software architect architecture playlist. I'm not sure how I'm gonna call it, but basically I'm gonna cover very interesting topics such as caching, databases, transactions, queues, scalability, clustering, and of course, load balancing, and pretty much a lot of interesting stuff that not that many developers know and could take your knowledge to the next level. But let's get started with load balancing. So here we see a little diagram, all right? So we basically have a web app and a phone that is going to interact with our servers. So first of all, as you can see, load balancer is here, highlighted in red. And what it does, it basically lets us to distribute incoming network traffic from our devices across multiple resources. In our case, the web servers. And it ensures that these servers are highly available. Meaning if we get too much traffic, so let me put another arrow here. So we have twice as much traffic now, we still can make sure that we are, our servers are capable of handling the traffic. So basically this provides availability and reliability by sending requests to servers that can basically accept those requests coming from the client, okay? So we're gonna take a look at how load balancers actually do that. So interesting thing with load balancers is that in many architectures, yes, they are standing in front of the web servers, but they don't have to necessarily be here. Meaning if we, if we move our database here, we can in theory go copy our load balancer, put it after our web servers, and then have another layer here of, of caching servers and then connect it to them. So you can have as many load balancers as you want. And that's what I'm trying to say. But why again would you need a load balancer? So modern websites get thousands of users, right? Millions. Let's take Facebook. They have millions of active users at the same time. So it means we're going to have a lot of concurrent requests coming from the clients. So to cost effectively scale the whole architecture with high volumes, modern computing best practices suggest to have a load balancer. As we said, it sits in front of the servers and routes these requests that are coming from the client. So what kind of distribution does a load balancer or is a load balancer capable to do? It's capable to route based on a, let's say a host. So I'm gonna change the color. Let's say a host, let's say it can route everything that's coming from a, from this domain and it is coming from a different domain, let's say instagram.com, even though Instagram belongs to Facebook, by seeing this host name, it can use a different type of a load balancer, even if this system is tightly coupled, all right? It can also check the path. So let's say we're hitting the, we want to hit the Facebook's API, but there's V1 API and not API, but like the path. And there's also V2. So what I'm trying to say is that you can have a separate load balancer for V1 and V2. So this is based on a path and you can also have content-based load balancers. So we're saying that this load balancer is only responsible for image content, content for media content, and the other load balancer that we have is responsible for any other content, all right? So interesting thing is that we also have different types of load balancers. So the first and the most popular one is of course the software load balancer. Software load balancer can be, so I'm gonna write software will be. This is basically the Amazon Amazon's load balancer. You can also have it in Azure, in Google Cloud, everywhere, and it's very flexible. So you don't have to have anything physical to set up. You can watch tutorials and get going like in a couple of minutes. And you can also have a hardware, right? 
old school hardware load balancer. I definitely don't know in which use cases you would want to have a hardware load balancer. Maybe if you have your services or servers on premise, which can happen if it's a factory, if it's some government organization that doesn't trust third parties, you can have a um, hardware load balancer. And now the most important or the most interesting thing is what kind of algorithms does load balancer use to, to, to determine whether it should route the request to this server? So let's say server one or server two. Let's say you make a request. Which server is it going to route your request to? There are a couple algorithms. The first one is called round robin. So let's type them here. Round robin. Round robin does the following. So I'm going to really take a pen. So we have a request coming. So it's going to route the first request here, the second request here, third here, fourth here, oops. Yeah, fourth here, fifth here. So as you can see, it just skips the server one by one. And it's this way it's, it's gonna try to distribute them accordingly, All right? Let's remove the arrows. The second algorithm, also popular, is called weighted round robin. This means that every server, in our case, we have two servers, they have weights. So let's say this one is two and this one is one. So the way this is gonna work, we get a request. We're gonna route two requests here, one, two. The third one is gonna go here. The fourth one here, the fifth one here, the sixth one here. It basically indicates that one of the servers has a higher capacity to handle requests. Therefore, it's gonna get more requests more requests to handle, all right? So what else do we have here? Let's remove this. There's also an algorithm called least connections. Actually, let's expand our list, weighted round robin. The third one would be least connections. So the load balancer is gonna determine which server has the least number of connections, and it's simply gonna route the request to that server. For example, let's say the web server has 10 active connections, the server one has 20. So it's gonna route the request to this web server too because it has less active connections. This is pretty useful. And now the complicated ones, the ones that are used uh, mostly, I would say, is the least response time. So least response time. And you might ask, how does a load balancer know how many connections and what the response time for every web server is? Well, it does, it, it works as a ledger and it keeps track of the health of every server that is connected to, so it knows how to manage the requests that are incoming, all right? So the least response time is gonna check which server is able to basically return the data the fastest, and it's gonna use that one. The next one, the fifth one, is gonna be the least bandwidth. So least band, bandwidth. So the least bandwidth is basically which server returns the least amount of data at this point of time. If web server one is too like too much under pressure and it's returning a lot of data over a network connection, then we're gonna use the web server two or vice versa. And the last but not least, at least among the popular ones, is hashing. This is kind of a stupid algorithm. So it's not even an algorithm, but just a way. So what you're gonna do is, for example, say that the requests coming to this URL are always going to be redirected to web server one or the request coming to this other URL is going to be forwarded to web server two. Basically you're, you're tagging your servers or your URLs to be routed to the particular server. It's kind of stupid, so it doesn't really scale well. And speaking of scaling, these are basically all the advantages of the load balancing. So it can scale, meaning if it notices that two servers are not enough, it's going to create a new one. It's going to, going to create a new one. Now we have three services and it can route the new requests there. And it's also flexible and usually load balancers are like efficient because they're not so sophisticated, okay? So again, the features are auto-scaling. It can also remember the sessions. So for example, if your user authenticated to web server one and the next request they sent a headers, their load balancer is gonna remember that these headers were used in the web server one, so you're gonna stay authenticated. Um, it also has health checks. So as I said previously, it knows which web server is alive or not. It can also 
like contain certificates so you can it can work over HTTPS. It can compress, so it's also able to using GZIP algorithm, algorithm and so on, and it also can hash or cache, sorry. It can also see the logs of all these servers. So you can configure your load balancer so that every server is sending their logs to the load balancer, like uh, where all the, all the logs are collected in one central place. And it can also trace the requests, meaning that every request that's coming to load balancer can be traced and determined which server was handling it. All right. So if you guys liked this episode of the system designs or architecture, I don't know how I'm going to call it yet, please give me a like and stay tuned for new episodes. And I'm going to see you in the next video. Hey there, it's me again. I just wanted to quickly say thank you very much for watching this video and smashing the like button. And if you want to stay up to date with such cool topics, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss whenever a new video is out. And I'm going to see you in the next one.